Welcome everyone uh, to our webinar around the future of consumer metaverse uh, in partnership with uh, Inmersal. My name is Iñaki Amate and I'm your host today. Uh, I'm going to be uh, facilitating a hopefully very fascinating uh, conversation and presentations uh, around the world of the, of the metaverse. And um, today we have a very interesting program, very good program um, with uh, first uh, an introduction of the of the people that are going to be uh, participating today, and then we will have some presentations from them. Um, um, we will have also a, a possibility to talk a little bit and uh, with the presenters at the end. So we are going to have some definitely some time to to have questions at the end of the of the session. And of course, if in the meantime you have uh, anything that you want to to ask to consider, you can put it on the chat. Um, so today we have with us um, um, uh, three really good uh, presenters. We have uh, Matthias Koski, who is the CEO of Inmersal. We have Kylie Lindsay, who is a principal consultant at the Worldwide Technology. And then Theo Thales, uh, who is the creative director of uh, Graviton Interactive. Um, so before we start, I just wanted to, to give a little bit to everyone a little bit of context of what we are going to be talking today. Um, so we are going to be uh, talking about the metaverse. <clears throat> the metaverse is the future state of the content and experience for the internet. Uh, it's <clears throat> something to be considered under Web3, which is, <clears throat> which is the next generation of decentralized technologies and structures enabling um, the, next, the new paradigm. These te te technologies uh, allows us to uh, do things like, you know, creating fluidity in markets and ecosystems, um, and, and also fluidity within the enterprise. Um, they they basically rely on a number of things. You know, they allow open some new possibilities for peer-to-peer -peer transactions, uh, faster growth, innovative structures, and more collaboration. But also the metaverse brings more immersive and engaging experiences, deeper connections to and among humans, graceful debates between the physical and the digital worlds, and opportunities to create exploration and experimentation. Um, many of you probably are wondering why we are still talking about the metaverse. Has that uh, gone away already, that, uh, the, the, uh, that, word, that buzzword? But today we are going to show you that actually in, in reality, it's still very much alive. It's definitely a, a trend that is uh, uh, having quite a lot of momentum and attraction at the moment. We are going to show you that um, the numbers are also talking by itself. You know, it's uh, 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 the metaverse uh, number of unique users by 2030 is expected to be roughly around 5 billion. Um, uh, it right now is a is a market of about five hundred billion dollars, and is expected to grow to eight hundred billion dollars by twenty twenty four. And already today, there are a number of companies that are actually starting to do, or not starting to do. They are actually doing uh, significant volumes of business with the with the metaverse. We have companies like Nike that are already uh, doing about one hundred and eighty five million in NFT revenue, they are doing about uh, 1.3 billion in secondary sales. Um, similarly, Gucci, uh, 10 million in NFTs, about 31 million in secondary sales. So you can see that, I mean, it's a, it's a real business, it's a real opportunity for companies. And of course, there are a number of elements that, I mean, companies need to take into consideration when doing, um, when doing uh, a, a strategy to go into the, meta in the metaverse, from thinking a little bit about what is going to be the, the, the future of the human experience that they want to bring alive, uh, why can, what, is the, what are the next generation of technologies, uh, what is the distribution and the, uh, and the ecosystems that they are going to create. But more importantly, I think they need to take into consideration things like why they need to be there, what is that they want to do, and how they are going to do it. And that's why today we are going to have a few presenters, our presenters talking a little bit about exactly that, you know, why, why you should consider being in the metaverse, what is that you can do, and, you know, what are the best way to do it. So with that, I'm going to hand over to uh, our first presenter, Matthias, uh, from Immersal. Matthias, you're welcome. Go ahead, please. Thank you. 
I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Matthias Koski, I'm the CEO of, of Immersal. And uh, we used to be like a small startup in the past, but now we are part of Hexagon, which is uh, about 35 billion euros uh, corporation from Sweden. And we have 24,000 employees in 50 different countries. So I will give you like short introduction about the tech in the background and then kind of like paint the big picture what will happen going forward and then I will let Kyle and Theo explain about the specific use cases and the market overall. So let's kick off. So here you can see the building blocks of, of Metaverse. So most of you might know like Pokemon Go and like Snapchat, AR filters and so on. But kind of like if you want to have an interactive metaverse, you have to have spatial mapping in the background, which means that uh, you have to scan the environment with your mobile phone or like 360 cameras, and then you get spatial map out from the pictures. This spatial map is then like matching readable version of the real world. And when you have the map, you have to be able to localize yourself within the map, which means that uh, you have the exact location of the user and also the rotation of the device. So when you start to add interactive 3D content on top of this, we have to know where you are standing and where you are how you are holding your phone that we can like fully align the real world with digital life. And Kyle and Theo will explain more use cases for this, but this is kind of like we understand the background. So this is also the reason why the metaverse has kind of like kicked off slowly because it's it's bloody difficult. And I don't start to explain about AR classes because it's even more difficult to make them work. So let's move on. So here you can see example of, of the spatial map. So there's lots of small dots that uh, machine will then recognize where you are. So basically, uh, this is a map from uh, Central Railway Station from Finland and also the Metro Underground. And uh, the idea is that you have like hundreds of thousand pictures from this environment. Once you take one picture with your mobile phone, tablet or AR glasses, it will compare that one picture to hundreds of thousands of pictures. And then as an output from that, you will get the exact location and rotation of the device. This map can be used for AR, gaming, uh, navigation, or also like in the future, robots and cars will use the same map. So the idea is that you have like one map, but several use cases. This is kind of like painting the big picture, how it will look like going forward. I don't expect that no one will go now in the city and kind of like use their phone and look what's what's happening around. But let's say in five, four years, when you have AR classes, you can have this kind of like AR overlay on top of your world. You can have different kind of infotainment ads, you can also integrate e-commerce in real life. And the next video is more about like what is already available now and what can be not done now.
So the key idea is to kind of like give a new kind of uh, experience for the customers and also like monetize the investment and uh, give more revenue for the for the stadiums or football clubs, ice hockey teams and so on, whoever owns the owns the location. And uh, this is kind of like how it will look like in coming years. So you will have lots of different kind of experiences. So you can have like something in museums. Then uh, this may be one of my favorite one, the real estate showing. So let's say you are walking on the streets in some like really nice area with, with your partner and you are looking apartment from this, this specific area. You can just take your phone from your pocket, look around, and you can see what kind of flats is available in that, that specific area. Or then there can be also some like uh, learning experiences for the kids in the school or close by the school. One key thing to remember is that there's already 15 billion devices. So we don't have to wait anymore. The tech is already available here. So this includes all of the iOS, Android, and Huawei devices. And uh, in addition to this one, there is about a couple of hundred thousand AR classes as of now. I don't have the latest info, but it's somewhere there at the moment. Thank you. If you have any questions, so please send me an email or call me. And over to you. Is it Theo or Kyle? I think you're handing it off to me. So let me grab the screen. Yeah. Let me know when you can see the slides. Is yes, coming through. Okay. Good. All right, uh, I'll jump right in. Thank you, Matej. This is uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Kyle Lindsay. Good morning from Denver, Colorado, where it's uh, getting into the evening time. I am a principal consultant with Worldwide Technology, where I focus in on leading the engineering efforts for emerging technologies. Uh, things like AI, uh, specifically, I think, most of my meetings over the last couple weeks have been around chat bots and chat GPT, but also focused in a lot on computer vision, digital twins, XR. And really today I'm here to talk about uh, leveraging XR within sports fan experiences and our experience in this field at WWT. Um, in my day job, I also focus in on video game companies, theme parks, movie, TV, so the world of entertainment and really how entertainment leverages technology and really specifically metaverse technologies. So why are we trying to leverage metaverse technologies XR in sports? Really, it comes from the fact that but fundamentally is a declining in-person attendance in sports. You have this, this Generation Z and then the younger Gen Alphas that nearly half of all Gen Zers said they've never ever watched a professional sporting event in person. Uh, Gen Alpha, the one that comes after Gen Z, uh, also very, very small amount of interaction within a professional sports environment of actually attending. And these are the kids, this is the younger generation that's grown up on esports and gamification. So the expectations of interactivity, personalization is very high. So how can we leverage these spatial technologies, these metaverse technologies to bring this next generation uh, not only into uh, whether it be a stadium, whether it be a venue, whether it be a field, but actually have them become sports fans. Um, so like I said, this is one of the aspects that we have been looking into at Worldwide Technology to some fascinating results. Uh, 
a few examples, and this is starting to be leveraged. Um, you can see a few things here. The one I really like, and we will be sharing out these slides in the right hand side, is this photo booth where you can actually go through and pick individual players and take a photo with them in augmented reality as a take home. You can see in the middle, you have some experiences, once again, using augmented reality, either in the stadium, in the middle and the bottom, but also the racing example is a great one of taking racing into the living room. And that's something that we've been exploring here at WWT of how you can leverage and bring these technologies to a wider base. So what we've started with is what we call golf AR. And what we looked at was you have tracking mechanisms to track the golf balls when you're watching golf on TV. We thought, is there a way to take that tracking technology and actually put it into augmented reality? Whether that be on a phone, whether that be on a tablet or onto glasses. So we partnered up with Top Tracer for our WWT Maya Coba tournament for phase one. So the initial testing was we took this out to hole number seven at the El Chameleon Golf Course a couple of years ago, accessing the API from the Top Tracer system. And you can see the results. It was pretty amazing. It was very exciting to see the golfers get really excited about how they could leverage this technology. There was a lot of talk about not only from a for sports fan experience, but also could they use something like this from a training tool set? Uh, there's, like I said, a lot of buzz around it. So the metrics we tested within this initial phase was distance, the launch angle, ball speed curve, uh, spin, club path. So really all of the typical metrics that you would expect from a tracking system. But once again, it, it was an early tech demo and we were just barely leveraging the glasses. So what we did now, we're moving to phase two. So this phase two, we're going to be doing later this year at hole 16 at Muir Field for the Memorial Tournament, where we're going to be connecting into the new TrackMan system. That is the new system that the PGA is leveraging here in the States and taking it onto a new set of glasses. Um, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of this technology is pretty early. Uh, one thing that we really ran into in our first test was just the quality of the fidelity of the visuals outside. When you're outside in the bright sun, uh, it's kind of tough. It's tough to see. So we've seen companies like Magic Leap. Um, maybe we'll see something from Apple coming out soon. Uh, from a few other companies where we're seeing some new technologies that are actually helping for the exterior usage uh, within these sports environments. Uh, so it's a really exciting time for us. It's an exciting time with golf. We know uh, a lot of our internal golfers are excited. I, I can tell you that I get pinged all the time. When can I come and test it and play with it? Uh, and then a lot of our customers, um, a lot of our clients within the golf sports field are interested in start trying to leverage this technology. Like I said, not only from a sports fan experience, uh, but also you can look in training, um, just skill set up leveling. There's a lot of applications that can be used here. So along with the golf that we are doing, we're also doing work with racing. This is the WWT Raceway in Southern Illinois here in the States. And what we decided to do was take the racetrack and put it into augmented reality as just a test. Well, that test was very successful. So then we decided to move to the point where let's get the cars running around it using simulated data. Well, that really excited the track people, the owners, uh, NASCAR, IndyCar. Um, so now what we're working towards is how do we take this and actually 
add real time telemetry? How can we actually make this the actual race that you can watch either we're doing this on the STEM lane. So the, the, the science, technology, engineering and math for the kids at the racetrack. But we're also looking at this, how can we bring this experience to your living room? How can we bring it with the actual race that's going on? So looking at technologies around telemetry, looking at technologies around computer vision, a lot of really exciting things there. And then the other thing we try to do, once again, we're trying to get this younger generation, we're trying to get the Gen Zs, we're trying to get the Gen Alphas, we're trying to get them excited about it. So it's really that personalization, it's the interactivity um, that really gets them. So how could we take a physical car race and how we can almost layer on a video game on top of it? How can we make it so they can actually interact with it? How that? How can we take it so as the cars are going around the track, you can actually take a little cone of light and drop it on it and have the tires come up and have you be able to pop those tires and get points. And another important aspect of it is how can you compete with your friends? How can you compete with your friends at the racetrack? How can you compete with your friends around the world? These multiplayer aspects, multi-user aspects of augmented reality are still early. We're using some of Titus Point, Immersal, um, there's a lot of SLAM technologies, but there's so much excitement that's really being built around leveraging these spatial technologies for fan experiences. And the other aspect that we have is our pit stop. Uh, this is a really fun one where you can interact with a full-size race car. You can jack up the car, you can take your impact wrench, you can take the tires off, you can fuel your car, um, you can go and race your friends. Uh, so there's a lot of just experiential excitement here. There's a lot of interest, uh, but there's a lot of interest from the advertising, from activation standpoint. Point. So imagine that you can take this pit, star, pit stop vehicle and change the race team, change the car. You can take it from an Indy car to a racing truck to an ass car, really. Um, so there's a lot of options. Uh, so it's, it's an exciting space for us. It's one of many that we're doing at WWT. Um, but I'm just happy to share some of the things that we're working on here. Theo, I think I'm handing it off to you. Ah, thank you, Kyle. Appreciate it. All right, I'm going to share my screen. None of you. All right, can we see that? Yes. Yes. All right. So uh, in case you guys missed it, uh, my name is Theo Dales. I'm from Sydney, Australia, um, and I'm from Graviton Interactive. I'm the creative director. I, day to day, I create augmented reality experiences um, that is all involved with gaming, navigation, and also marketing. So let's jump in. So I'll be talking about the possibilities of augmented reality and why you should be excited. So on the agenda, uh, how AR can be used as a marketing tool. That's actually probably the main one that actually goes through all of the other things I'll be talking about. Um, how augmented reality can be used as games, augmented reality as a navigation tool and how VPS technology plays a big part in that. And I'll be touching on web-based augmented reality as well. So to get us started, what actually is augmented reality? Just in case you guys aren't quite familiar with the term. It's a bit of a funny phrase. Uh, you may have heard of virtual reality. Um, is augmented reality the same or similar as virtual reality? Well, let's find out. So the main differences between augmented reality and virtual reality is that AR superimposes digital information such as computer generated images, 3D models, text, that sort of thing, onto the user's view of the real world. So that's camera data, say from your phone, with digital information laid up in front. So it has that 
connection with the real world. Uh, this is mostly currently accessible through mobile phone technology, iPhones, Androids, <clears throat> that sort of thing, and tablets. VR, on the other hand, uh, is a fully immersive technology. Often you've seen that through people wearing headsets. Um, this immersive uh, experience is totally separate from the real world. And I think that is the primarily the main difference between augmented reality and virtual reality. So now that we've got that off, uh, you've probably seen or used augmented reality before. Uh, when you think of AR, uh, we've mentioned Pokemon Go before. Uh, it's probably one of the first examples that comes to your mind. Uh, everyone knows what Pokemon Go is. It's really good. It's a lot of fun. Um, but there's actually so much more to AR than that. Augmented reality has been pushed much, much further since that game took over the world eight years ago. Oh. But how can AR be used as a major part of a successful marketing campaign? This is going into the further use of how it can be done. AR apps are being used as a very effective marketing tool for many companies. Many companies are jumping on board. Uh, augmented reality can create a much more increased customer engagement to your brands and your products if used effectively. For instance, when I say this, uh, different ways that you could take advantage of AR in your marketing are using it for in-store customer experiences, uh, using it to uh, show all of your, cust uh, your, your custom options for your products that are available and to implement it in marketing campaigns and advertisements. So I'll be focusing in on the fashion industry. Uh, it's a very good example because the fashion industry have been going all in on augmented reality, uh, more so than lots of other industries. One of the cool things you can do with AR and fashion is that you can try on clothes before you buy. So there'll be 3D models of clothes uh, that will be tracked to your body or to your feet for shoes or a hat, for instance, and you can try these things. Many brands are doing this already. Uh, when it comes to AR virtual fashion, there are several benefits you might want to consider. For one, customers can easily try on every single one of your products that you have available without the need to actually physically try them on. You can even do this online if you wish, or you can be in the store. Customers are engaging with your products in this way, uh, increases their confidence in that product hugely. And by this happening, they're more likely to commit to actually purchasing the product when they try these things on. So you can have an in-store experience, but you can also have an at-home or mobile AR experience for these types of things. Customers will be compelled to stop at your store if there is an AR experience present, especially at the front of the store. Visitors will uh, flock to your store and they'll try to visualize everything they can see there. It's super cool. Um, however, it's not limited to just the physical location. Um, you can definitely have augmented reality apps that you can try on through mobile apps. Um, plenty of fashion try-on experiences are included or are part of other social media apps, uh, such as Snapchat and Instagram. They're big, big players in that field. Um, these apps have millions and millions and millions of people using them, so there's absolutely no shortage of eyes that can potentially get your brands in front of. One uh, notable benefit of these try-on experiences is that they're also much less likely to return an item after you purchase it online. I don't know if you guys are the same, but I see something online and I realize after trying it on, even if it fits, I actually didn't like it. Um, if I had tried them on beforehand, maybe uh, I'll be more likely to keep it or make the right decision in the first place. Uh, visualization. Uh, so fashion labels like Gucci, uh, they've been doing this for a while now. They're doing it very, very well. They're doing shoes and bags and all these things. Um, and also cosmetics brands, uh, makeup, lipstick, foundation, uh, L'Oreal, a notable example who have been jumping straight into this augmented reality type experience. Um, they have been getting great benefits out of this. Um, types of things you can do is, yeah, shoes, as I said. With all this said, though, the AR retail fashion industry is expected to grow to 
about $61.3 billion by 2031. It's going up and fast. So keep an eye on that. It doesn't just stop at fashion though. Um, I'll be talking about some, uh, what I like to call product configurators. So these are augmented reality apps that show off all of the products customization options. And uh, these are a very powerful way to show off everything your product has to offer. Um, it's also a fantastic way of visualizing an object in real world scale. For instance, this car, you could see if it would actually fit in your garage or not. Maybe you have a very small garage. I don't know. Um, the main benefit is, is you can see, say, potential colors, different color paint options for your car, mix and match it with different types of wheels, different tints for the windows. Uh, it's, it's really awesome. The very powerful, but it's not limited to just cars. Um, one of my favorite examples of product configurators is Ikea. They have an augmented reality app, which allows you to see Ikea furniture within your own living room or in your own bedroom. And you can see how everything will look before you purchase it within your own space, but not just furniture and cars, uh, <laughs> pretty much anything can be applied to, uh, skateboards. This is an example we made, you try on different wheels, different board designs. Um, the possibilities are endless in terms of products. When it comes to more direct marketing and advertisement, augmented reality is a very effective way of advertising your product and services. Uh, these are often what I like to refer to as Instagrammable uh, experiences, meaning that these AR experiences lend themselves very well to sharing to others via social media, uh, especially among younger demographics, Gen Z and, and such. Um, they love to use this kind of technology and it allows your marketing to get more eyes on it via social media sharing. Uh, it's a very easy way of getting some form of viral marketing. Um, uh, types of products that are using this very well and it lends itself very well too uh, include things like movies and TV show tie-ins as a new show is coming out. Um, food brands are doing this very well as well. Uh, as you can see here, <laughs> I like the one in the middle. Uh, the burger with the performer on top is very funny to me. So moving on, but also related to all that is video games. Uh, augmented reality is a interactive medium first and foremost. So video games lend themselves very well, um, and have been playing a very big part in such pushing augmented reality technology forward. In my opinion, I think augmented reality games are some of the most exciting use of technology and there's heaps of potential here. Here's why companies are using AR games. They want to create immersive spatial experiences. This means that when you play them, you are fully immersed. And if you're anything like me, you will struggle to stop playing them. These are very addictive. Um, you know what that means though? So. This immersion translates to increased engagement and time spent with the AR experiences and the associated brands. People are just going to keep coming back for your product. These, uh, you can do branded tie-in AR games as well, uh, is another avenue that you could consider. Players can be incentivized to play for real prizes like free food and coupons, and they're likely to keep coming back and engaging with your marketing to earn daily rewards, for instance and things like that. That's really great for engagement. And best of all, these are all very memorable experiences that will stick in your customers' minds for time to come. That brand recognition is very key. So it's not all fun and games. The next most interesting and useful use of augmented reality technology is navigation. This is something we've been dabbling with at Graviton. Uh, it's all about helping and guiding users to navigate different spaces that they're not necessarily familiar with, with digital enhancements that AR provides. Uh, VPS technology is particularly useful for this. Uh, that's our friends over at Immersal. So what is VPS? Uh, it's a form of augmented reality tracking, simply. It recognizes physical details of digitally scanned real-world locations through your mobile device's camera. Um, 
yes, uh, Matthias was talking about how this works. I won't go on too much more about that, but it's super duper handy. Um, one of our own examples of us doing this, we created a navigation app for a Sydney train station. Uh, it'll visually show you how to get from platform to platform. Um, it places directions and uh, locations and it'll get you to point A to B very quickly. Uh, using VPS to navigate these spaces is uh, much more preferable to using GPS. You might be thinking, why not use GPS? Uh, that's because VPS is a lot more accurate uh, in a meter to millimeter scale uh, compared to GPS, uh, especially for indoor spaces where, say, something like Google Maps might not exactly know where you are. AR in this way is also being used to help shoppers navigate different stores. Um, imagine only wanting one certain item at a shop. Uh, AR apps could potentially direct you to the exact spot in the shop with the correct aisle and location and tell you how many things of this particular item are in stock. I know I like, I don't, <laughs> I can imagine all the uh, introverts here today don't like asking people where the thing is. They'd rather do it themselves if they had an app. I think that'd be hugely beneficial there. These apps can also help you not get lost in these stores. Uh, Ikea comes to mind for me. I get lost every single time I go to Ikea. That place is huge. Having an app there would be very beneficial to me. So before I finish up, I would like to briefly touch on web-based augmented reality. Typically, augmented reality might be experienced through a downloaded app, but web AR is augmented reality that is experienced entirely within a web browser. Um, so that means it is very lightweight experience that doesn't require the user to download an app. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I really don't like downloading unnecessary apps uh, if I don't need to do that. If an AR experience is offered at a very low commitment as a low commitment browsing app, access through a QR code, for instance, then the likelihood of me actually engaging with that content is much higher. If your AR experience is implemented in a web solution, users are much more likely to actually use and interact with it. Web AR is much more accessible for users, for instance. More companies are starting to realize this benefit of web AR and they are, uh, and are increasing the potential reach of their own AR experiences and their marketing. 1.73 billion devices are already compatible with augmented reality. So there's definitely no sh uh, potential shortage of users. Uh, companies that play around with web AR is 8th Wall and Zap AR. They do great things in the space. Uh, they make, uh, they allow for games and marketing and all these sort of things. Pretty much everything I've been talking about here today. So in summary, AR, it's really great. Love AR. <laughs> I'm very excited to see where companies take that tech. Uh, we've only just barely scratched the surface of what is possible. More and more people are using AR in their apps in their day-to-day -day lives, and almost everyone's phones are already compatible with AR. Companies are starting to realize this and definitely consider starting using yours in your company's marketing as well. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, oops. He can't hear you. Okay. I'm not, not yet. We can't hear you. <clears throat> Happens to me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> 
double mute, triple mute. Yeah, exactly. Hi, all this is. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. yes there you go. I don't know what happened. I was on, and then all of a sudden it disappeared. I was just going to say thank you, Brasil, Matias, and Kyle. Um, perfect. So I think that um, we we encourage you to set uh, to send us some of the questions you might have on the on the chat. Um, we're going to start with uh, actually with some of the questions that are starting to come in. Um, so the first one is: Did you notice a slowdown in the development of AI technologies? It seems a lot of companies shifted uh, the capital towards AI investments instead of Web three zero, uh, and VC capital is getting a lot tighter too. So who who wants to answer this? Uh, I can start. So at least what I can see in the media: so companies are like investing billions of dollars for AR, VR, metaverse. So I, I can kind of like can't see the slowliness at least yet. I don't know, Kyle, Theo, how do you see it? How do you see it? Uh, it's all chime in here. So a, a lot of my customers have been dabbling for many years now, <clears throat> trying to experiment and do very, very early kind of proof of concepts. I would say in the last year, they're taking it a little bit more serious. Um, but I have not seen anything move from an AR, from a capital or a funding standpoint from a project to AI, but I fully expect that to happen. Um, but what excites me the most, and this is one thing I'd like to hear more people talk about, is actually the combination of AR, VR, the, the, the umbrella of XR, and then the additive nature of AI. I think everybody tries to like say, okay, it's either this or this, it's not. And that's kind of the theme of the metaverse is it's not, we're gonna, everybody's gonna be VR. Everybody's gonna be this, everybody's gonna be, that's not the case really. All of these technologies, all these emerging technologies actually are additive. So when you add these compelling chat bots on top of these amazing avatars, on top of this amazing augmented reality, leveraging immersal, that's really where we build the metaverse. So that's kind of what I see. And that's kind of the talking points that I have with a lot of the folks I talk to. I, I completely agree. I think that we should look at um, AI as uh, a way to enhance almost anything that we, we come across in life, right? And of course, um, the metaverse, AI, VR are being like extensions of our experiences, right? Into new domains. There should be something that can be benefiting from the integration with this in the fantastic technology that AI is, is, coming, is bringing. Uh, have we started to see some practical examples of the, that integration anywhere? Have you guys come across already some examples of that? I mean, there are so many applications coming now very quickly, every single day, new things coming with uh, AI. But do you see applications where you see AI coming into the, uh, into the realm of the metaverse? I can uh, talk yeah. about one. Well, I can talk about one I just had today. And it was a conversation with a customer that was interested, they're big healthcare, and they were interesting, and I think I mentioned it, of leveraging these chat bots, chat GPT, in an avatar, in augmented reality, to address loneliness. So it was a fascinating conversation, and they're 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 a pretty big company. Um, but it was kind of exploring of, is there something that can be done there? And it kind of made my, my mind spin of, yeah, I think there's probably some interesting things that can be done in that space. Uh, yeah, totally, totally, be... totally agree. Yeah. Um, I, I was about to provide the example of, um, once, uh, wearable glasses, augmented reality technology starts to pick up a lot further. Um, I think AI will be much more intrinsically part of that too. Um, things like personal assistance and things like that will just uh, go crazy uh, once once that's all going. Um, all the hands-free nature of it uh, will just make it really good. Yeah, and I also believe that AI will boost Metaverse because like <clears throat> maybe Theo can explain more about this, but uh, generating 3D content is like very manual process and it takes lots of time. But going forward, when you get this from like 
some kind of AI, AI software. It will kind of like decrease the cost and uh, help yes. kind of like boost the markets. Definitely. Um, my day to day is uh, making 3D models, uh, creating content in AR. Um, certainly, I've already seen uh, AI assisting in that process as well. Um, there's there's tools that allow for quick, uh, quickly making animations and uh, models and things like that. Those are still in development. Ones we've been using and experimenting with is more on the uh, the art creation side. So we've made had this example where we had these interdimensional portals uh, on the side of a building, and the universe behind that portal was actually generated using artificial intelligence, um, using some fantastical uh, descriptions <laughs> like that. Um, so that's definitely one way of doing it. Um, it, it goes beyond all that though, but yes, uh, from what I've been using, we've been using it as tools to quicken up the process and also ways of uh, speeding up the, get, getting the vision onto the screen into Unity or Unreal Engine. Fantastic. A, a few more questions are coming through. So um, is there, do you guys have any um, visibility on when next generation of VR and uh, AR headsets are coming into the market? Uh, I suppose we wait for Apple. I, I'm particularly <laughs> excited for what Apple yeah. are about to do um, when WWDC comes around. Um, it may not be the the thing that everyone is specifically looking for right now, but uh, eventually Apple will make something great. They very rarely just drop something. The first generation of Apple products are always uh, more for the enthusiasts. Uh, they come for it to try it out, do the new thing. And eventually from there, Apple do a very, very good job of bringing things into the mainstream. Um, so if anyone to, uh, to do that, I believe it's Apple and that should be soon. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I, I, I think everybody's kind of holding their breath to see what Apple comes out with. But even like now, Magic Leap 2, I think Magic Leap 2 has got some great tech. I think some of the stuff that Unreal has come out with, um, it, I was at CES earlier this year. And if you look at like the component architectures, the lens technologies, the battery technologies, so there's a lot. I, I think we're going to see... I think we're going to see this hockey stick of growth to the point where it's literally just glasses. And I think that's really the exciting point for AR that kind of changes the whole paradigm. So now every, when everybody has it on their head, that is really interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the um, boost of uh, the metaverse probably was due to the um, big investment that Facebook did around Meta. And of course, um, the numbers that we've been sharing today, they, they look very promising, but they are in a horizon that looks more towards 2030 and beyond, right? Do you guys have any uh, specific numbers that show that the, the trend is still growing over the last 12 months? We lost you, but like I haven't seen any numbers. But typically, people kind of like overestimate the growth in the short term and underestimate the long term. So I think in the long term, the market will be huge, but it takes some time. It's not going to happen in the next twelve months. Yeah. Okay. I, I I so in my conversations, I actually like to use just the concept of moving from dial-up internet to always on kind of that, that cable modem side of internet, um, to mobile internet. It's a generational movement. And now everybody expects the internet at all times in their pocket. I see this kind of movement to the metaverse being just on that same trajectory, right? I mean, we're just, so when we talk about spatial, we talk about 3D internet, we talk about metaverse. To me, it's a given. I mean, I, I think we can, I mean, it's how we interact as humans, right? If you're, if you're sitting at your dinner table, I mean, it's, you're interacting in this 3D interactive environment. I, I fully expect that's just part of the journey that we're on. Yeah. 
Uh, what about uh, the the platforms? I mean, uh, uh, what do you think about, or what is your take on to open platforms versus proprietary platforms? I believe that there will be like several different platforms. In some point, there will be some kind of regulation. There is not regulation as of now, but there will be, and they will kind of like make sure that there will not be like one one single platform. Yes, the the more platforms doing different things, competing things, the better. I feel better for innovation and better for making sure one particular company don't control every single thing. Yeah, we're all on the same page. I want to see an open. I I do not want to see one company try to. If anything, it'll stifle it and it will slow it down. I mean, it's the same thing as the original. As we saw the internet kind of branch out from government and education into, I mean, we saw companies try to take it over. I, I don't want to see that. I want to see an open metaverse. Yeah. Uh, some of the examples you, you provided, I think, was Matthias. I mean, you were showing how you're mapping the real, the real world in order to start producing a synthetic version of it, where you basically, uh, I understand you basically lay on lay on top the, the synthetic objects right um can you tell us a little bit more i mean how does it work I and mean, how a typical project with a client would work and um, can you can you lay out um objects in locations that have not been scanned or, or how would you go around somebody that wants to basically start add, add, adding objects into places that have not been properly scanned yet Yeah, quite often customers don't know what they want, but they want to do something cool. So then we help them to kind of like brainstorm what it could be. And in some point, then they will share that what is the budget. And that's kind of always the limiting factor of these projects. And uh, as I said earlier, it's quite often a surprise how much creating a 3D content will cost. So it's it's not gonna be five thousand euros or five thousand USD. Typically, like fifty thousand, one hundred thousand, and so on. But yeah, and you always need kind of like the map first, and then you can start to create your experience. And if you have like let's say very interactive content, then it's always more complex and it's more expensive. Very good. Maybe maybe Theo, you can tell us a little bit about. Um... You know, in order to deliver a project like like what um, a campaign or a project like Matthias was talking about, what kind of yeah, skills? Definitely. What kind of skills do you need? What kind of people and uh, where do you find these kind of people? Um, talented people are all around the place. Um, I wouldn't. I I don't like to consider myself an expert. I'm always learning, but um, especially with uh, the VPS technology, I've been learning as I go. Um, the process involves physically going to that location and scanning the 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 data uh, but there's actually a specific way to do that um, it's easy enough to learn um, but it's very easy to uh, get it uh, get it wrong or get bad data out of it so that's part of the learning curve um, if the application requires uh, a user to scan their own environment um, I think the process is potentially simple enough for them to put their own content in there um, but otherwise, getting this 3D data and bring it into uh, game engines or uh, of your choice, whatever you like, and bringing that in and putting content in there is quite simple. If you're at least familiar with 3D technology, game technology, or Unity or Unreal Engine, um, it's as simple as placing objects next to that uh, point cloud, as you say, and and doing all that. and building it onto a, a device is is that last step. And, and is it easy to find people? Can you find people with uh, the, the skills and experience that you require in order to start building this type of um, campaigns and experiences? Are you, you speaking about uh, developers in particular? Yes. A 3D yes. modeler. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in a, in a, uh, there's, there's definitely no shortage of 3D modelers and uh, developers. Um, if a developer is familiar with games, generally, um, they can be quite easily shown how to use the augmented reality aspect of VPS technology. 
um, the resources are definitely out there, even if they're not themselves aren't currently familiar with it. Um, ga game developers and programmers are always very resourceful people, and they will always learn a new technology if there's availability there. There are plenty of specifically augmented reality developers. Uh, there's no shortage there. Um, it just depends where and for how much you would like to pay for that. Yeah, at least we have struggled to find right people, or let's say with right costs, because some of the gaming companies, let's say Supercell from Finland, they they pay quite well. So it, uh, it's really hard to compete with them in terms of salary. Then you have to give something else than money for these guys. Yeah. Um, I think it was uh, Theo that also talked a little bit about web AR and uh, the fact that you don't need to use glasses, right? Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about that technology? Yeah, uh, web AR is awesome. Um, typically, when you're on your phone and you want to have some kind of technology, some kind of augmented reality app, you're downloading a whole app for that. And that makes sense for certain applications but when it comes to smaller bite size experiences such as something that might be part of an advertising campaign for instance not necessarily a game it could be a game if you want um people will be very hesitant to actually download that out right um if there was say a qr code that uh someone taking uh sort of looking at this marketing can scan say on the side of a cereal box to try out their new cereal box a uh, fun augmented reality experience, it will not require them to actually download an app. It will just open, say, Safari on your phone or Google Chrome on your phone. You don't need to physically install an app on your phone. Um, this lends itself very well to that because it's it's slow commitment. No one actually wants to, say, download the KFC app or the McDonald's app on their phone. I mean, maybe some people do. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, it's, it, it just increases its level of accessibility i think accessibility is one of the biggest um, factors when it comes to people adopting new technologies um, if it's lightly slightly too inconvenient then people won't do it uh, depending on what the outcome is yeah yeah and, and maybe kyle or everyone else but i mean is there when when a client comes and is asking for um you know, doing something really, really cool, like Matthias was saying. Are they looking at those they should expect? Uh, you're, you're cutting out there you, for me. You're no, cutting you're, out. You're, you're, yeah, you're no. cutting out okay, for me yeah. too. You're cutting out for me too. Yeah, so I was talking about monetization and return of investment. Yeah, so I, I can I can kind of riff on that. So monetization, yeah, so I, return on uh, investment. Riff on that. So monetization, return on investment is is a is is a big deal. A big deal. And, and, I, and I, I'm hearing my I'm own voice back in my headset. I don't know. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hearing two of me. There we go. Um. So yes, it's it's very important. It's critical, right? And when we're dealing with our corporate clients, there, I mean, it's a big deal. I mean, the, the money is not as readily available globally as it was even just a year ago. Um, but I find most of most of my clients are still, let's say, kicking the tires, right? So they they understand that this is coming from an R and D fund. It's coming from marketing funds. Um, they're doing experiments where they're testing out with internal employees or testing out uh, with training environments. So, so the, a lot of my folks are not doing, they're, they're trying to just get their feet wet on the technology and what the technology is capable of. And then also I find um, it's, they're super excited about it but they're nervous about the tech stack. They're worried about the operational aspect of it. If they create a avatar, 
a AR avatar that's going to be their front desk person. How does how, how do you troubleshoot that? What happens when it breaks? What is that trouble ticketing? So that entire lifestyle, the entire life cycle of the tech, they're starting to think about, which actually is exciting, right? Because it means they're starting to think about how do we actually roll these experiences out to to client facing to customer facing to to actually commercial side as opposed to like dipping their toe so we're in that middle ground right now i at least i find with my folks yeah um i'm really sorry i mean it seems that we have some problems with the connection i hope that you can hear me now um maybe um if we we have not to i mean we have a little bit more time but i mean if anyone has some more questions please fire um if not i will probably ask one more um which is related to how blockchain as a technology is also utilized in in the in your projects how do you how do you come across and what do you do with it that's kind of like out of our scope i don't know kyle or theo have you used blockchain uh, so um, we've so yeah, we've it. sorry so we've had some interesting blockchain uh, from our side there was some i mean the you had the hype cycle of nfts just go off the charts right with board uh board ape yacht club and some of that stuff but there was definitely some pragmatic projects that some of our clients were looking at of using blockchain to create an nft uh, very specific for some kind of marketing campaign, but once again, I would say it's still it's still very early. I'm a big fan of blockchain. I think blockchain uh, is going to be a fundamental component of whatever the metaverse ends up turning out to be, um, but it's still early. Uh, that's at least from my side. Yeah, as for blockchain in say augmented reality. Um ultimately it has to make sense for the application that it's being used in. Not everything lends itself very well to blockchain technology. Not everything needs to have it in there. Um, that being said, if there's a particular reason to have that sort of that verification happening constantly within the application of the augmented reality, that's got nothing really to do with the augmented reality, <clears throat> augmented reality itself, but what the product is actually offering itself. So that will make sense in that case, I think. Okay. Maybe then uh, the last question to Matthias. Who owns all the data that is created in a project uh, where you basically layer content on top of a, of a virtual environment? Yeah, it depends about the platform. So if you do something with, with Meta, typically they, they own everything or with Google. And uh, then you have some open source platforms and then kind of like the creator owns the data. So it, it varies a bit about the platform. Okay. Very good. Um, so since we don't have any more comment, I mean, any more questions, maybe I can give you, if you, if any one of you want to do some closing remarks before we, uh, we close the session today. Um, if I think with uh, Kyle, you want to say anything before we withdraw? Uh, yeah, I, 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 so I'm not sure how many people saw it, and this is going to date this particular webinar, but um, you had a particular publication, I think it was in the States, that talked about how the metaverse is dead. Um, and then Tim Sweeney, the CEO and founder of Epic Games, immediately chimed in saying, yeah, tell that to the 600 million people who are using basically metaverse technology every day across Fortnite and Roblox and every other experience. So I, I would just say that it, we're in a very exciting time for technology specifically around metaverse. Um, I wouldn't call it dead, um, but I would also be cautious to, to strictly define what it is. And I think that's part of the fun, right? I, I think that's uh, part of the reason I, I feel very blessed that I just kind of play in this toy store on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, it's it's really that, isn't it? It's the it's so hard to so pin hard. down the definition of what metaverse is. Um, um, and I think that's some of the, the more challenging things for the public to start to accept. Ultimately, what I think will happen is um, 
ultimately people what I think will stop calling it metaverse. I think it'll almost be like phones versus it smartphones. Metaverse, I think it'll right? almost... we don't really call them smartphones anymore. At least most people don't. Um, I think we may uh, fall upon a a better term for it. Maybe something that's a bit more descriptive, or maybe several terms to describe different parts of it. I'm not quite certain what that will look like. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that goes, how, how companies start to talk about, uh, these technologies in a way that is useful to, for people to understand, uh, and compare the differences and how they function. Yeah. And I believe in the future. So the whole metaverse term will be kind of like redefined of the framework and like explain more accurately what it is and what it is not. Excellent. Um, good. Look, I mean, I think to, uh, with this, we can start concluding the, the webinar today. And uh, I want to thank you, uh, Kai, you, Matthias. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Uh, thank you very much uh, also to our sponsors, to Inmersal and to the FinCham for helping us to organize all this today. So, um, yeah, I hope you had a good one and you had a good chance to uh, get a lot of insights coming from this. Um, I'm looking forward to see you in the next webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. <clears throat> Have a lovely day. You too, Thank everyone. You.